with your host, Jaden Miller. Good day and welcome to Think About It with Jaden Miller. Thank you all for joining me on this podcast. Uh, I've got something different that I'm going to talk about today. Something uh, in regards to that other branch of government, the judicial branch, and I'm going to talk about a specific Supreme Court case. Uh, But before I do, don't forget to please like, share, and subscribe on my YouTube channel, and like, comment, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. As I say to you always, I'm on all of the plat- uh, podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, Spreaker, Google, CastBox, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and more. So please join me on any of those podcasts. Comment. Make sure that you comment. If you have something to say, something to share, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about the Plessy versus Ferguson case. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson is an important United States Supreme Court case uh, because what it did was it established this uh, thing called separate but equal in the United States. Uh, and I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Uh, the Plessy decision is a United States Supreme Court case from 1896. And what it did is it really set back racial relations. It set back this country in terms of how it could have moved forward as it relates to race right after slavery. Um And you will find that the Plessy versus Ferguson decision is considered one of the worst decisions ever made by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, If you are studying in class uh, civil rights cases or Supreme Court cases, specifically right after the Civil War, uh, hopefully this information will be able to assist you uh, in having uh, more knowledge about the case. All right. So uh, let me give you a little bit of a summary. So in 1896, the United States Supreme Court upheld state imposed race racial segregation in Plessy versus Ferguson. Again, this was a civil rights case involving Louisiana train cars. Um, It is one of the most famous Supreme Court decisions that solidified the separate but equal doctrine as the law of the land and allowed racially divisive Jim Crow regulations to take hold in southern states. All right. So let me just give you kind of a briefing on why Plessy versus Ferguson is so important. But before I do that, we've got to go back and we've got to check out the 14th Amendment because this definitely applies. So there are three amendments that came about after the Civil War. The first one was the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment is what freed the slaves. Okay, it was not the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 by uh, Abraham Lincoln. What that uh, did was that proclamation, it freed the slaves in the areas in which the North had taken control of. All right. But slavery was still lawful uh, throughout uh, the southern states. Okay, because remember, now they're a confederacy now. All right. So uh, Abraham Lincoln can only issue his proclamation in areas in which the uh, the Union soldiers had control. All right. So it wasn't until a uh, until uh, right after the Civil War, 1865, that uh, the 13th Amendment uh was born and freed African Americans from from bondage, from chattel bondage. Okay, uh, and then we had the Fourteenth Amendment, and then finally we had the Fifteenth Amendment. The Fifteenth Amendment is the amendment that gave African American males the right to vote. All right, so. In between the 13th and the 15th, we have this really important uh, amendment, the 14th. And the 14th Amendment came about during the Reconstruction era, where the United States now has come back together. 
uh, instead of it being the Union, uh, the North, and then the Confederate South, uh, it has now come back together. All right. And as a result, Congress has decided that it needs to implement certain laws. Okay. Because the United States now has a black problem. All right. So think about this for a moment because you are on Think About It with Jaden Miller. Um, you had all of these black people now that are free. They can no longer be slaves. They can no longer be under the auspices of someone else in terms of their lives. OK, can't be decided or they can't be owned by anyone else. All right. But politically, who are they? What are they? OK, uh, because, as you know, black people were not citizens all right, of the United States. And we'll talk later about the Dred Scott decision, which was another horrible decision made by the United States Supreme Court. But um, black people were not citizens. They were property. OK. And if you were a free person in the north or wherever, uh, you still were not considered a citizen of the United States. And that also meant that you did not necessarily or could not necessarily be a citizen of the state in which you resided. All right. So for all intents and purposes, black people in this country were not citizens. They didn't have any legal rights for the most part. All right. And so you have this black problem. All right. What do we do with all of these black people that are now free? OK, what is their political distinction? Do they have one? And so the United States Congress had to come up with something. All right. So that these people, OK, who are now considered people and not property anymore, have some kind of political designation in this country. And so the 14th Amendment was born and it reads all persons born or naturalized in the United States. All right. So let's stop there. OK, it says all persons born or naturalized in the United States. So that particular clause now makes black people persons. OK, so it's one thing to be a person, however, and another thing to be a citizen. OK, these are two separate things. OK, so I can be a person, but I'm not a citizen of Canada. All right. So now we've established that black people are not three fifths of a human being or property, that they are now persons. OK, that's the first part of that. And then it goes on to say and. All right. Subject to the jurisdiction thereof, meaning now that these persons, these black people that were formerly saved slaves are persons. And they are subject to the jurisdiction there of many the United States. All right. So now let's look at this second part of that. Because now it says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. All right. So now just that first sentence in the 14th Amendment declares that former black slaves are persons, OK, in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction of the United States and that they are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. All right. So now as we break apart that first sentence in the 14th Amendment, it's Important that you understand that those little words and and are like a n d and a r e, uh, those are big words, okay? Or of, okay? Those are big words, okay? All right, they mean so much, okay? They are conjunctions, at least and is, okay? That establishes, okay, that there are two parts to something, okay? They come come together, all right? So. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. All right. 
So now we have established via the 14th Amendment that former black slaves and and just black people in general, okay, are, are persons, first and foremost, in the United States, subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, and now are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. That's so important. All right. Now let's go to this next part. Okay. Because this next, these next parts are really, really important. Understand that in the 14th Amendment, specifically section one, okay, there are only two sentences. Okay. Now there are some, some punctuations, some, some semicolons, you know, that, you know, and of course some commas, but some semicolons. Okay you know, causing a pause or at least for a, a, a comma, but uh, causing a separation, you know, in terms of a semicolon in thought. But it brings you back. OK. All right. So just hold on and watch this. All right. So the second sentence is no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Why is that important? I'll tell you in just a minute. It says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Then the final, there's a semicolon, and then the final clause, and that says, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. All right. The 14th Amendment is so important in terms of that section one. So let's go back and look at that second sentence, and I'm going to break this down for you. All right. Again, it says, no state shall make or enforce any law. Again, any is in, is one of those really, really small words that says any. That means no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. All right. That means they can't lessen. OK, your privileges, they can't alter your privileges or your immunities. OK, why is this so important? I'll tell you after I read the next clause. It says, nor shall any state deprive any person. OK, there's any again. Those are so important of life, liberty or property without due process of law. So now let's go back in history, the United States history. All right, because now we need to understand where that comes from. All right. So we've got nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty or property. Where did you last hear that? For those of you that are students in American government or history, United States history. Well, remember when the United States decided that it wanted a separation or a divorce from Great Britain, Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence stated that we, meaning people, have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. Well, Thomas Jefferson was a was a, a studied the words of John Locke. John Locke was an English philosopher. Okay. And John Locke came up with this thing that we have natural rights. Okay. We have human rights. All right. But then also in when we decide that we want to be in a government, there's got to be some kind of a social order. Okay. But John Locke came up with this term and said that we as people, human beings deserve or have the right to life, liberty or property. That's John Locke. Thomas Jefferson just added on to that because Thomas Jefferson believed that persons had the right to life, liberty and property, but also the pursuit of happiness. Okay. All right. So that's where we hear that first part. It comes from John Locke, that English philosopher who had an influence over Thomas Jefferson and a lot of the other founding fathers in this nation. All right. But then there's this next part because there's a comma after property that says without due process of law. So let's go back again. We've got to go back to the Bill of Rights. And specifically, we have to go to the Fifth Amendment. 
Okay, because the Fifth Amendment is the amendment that talks about due process of law. Okay, well, why is this so important? Why is this now being repeated? So if in the Fifth Amendment, it says that we have the right, you know, at least implicitly in the Fifth Amendment says that we have the right to life, liberty or property. But explicitly, it says that those things cannot be deprived without due process of law. Why is that being repeated now in the 14th Amendment? OK, well, it's being repeated because the 14th Amendment also is this amendment that includes this term of indoctrination. What that simply means is that the first 10 Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government. So states, remember, there are states' rights. States have their own constitutions. Many states had their own Bill of Rights. Many states had were able to make their own laws. OK, that's why you had slavery in southern states and you didn't have slavery in northern states because the northern states did not want slavery. So they had their own constitutions, their own right to develop based upon the will of the people what they wanted. OK. All right. So the Fifth Amendment only applies to the federal government. Okay. So what the 14th amendment had to do is it had to establish that the bill of rights. Okay. And all of the, the, the amendments to the constitution, at least up until that point now apply to the states as well. OK, so remember, we have a system of federalism here. We have we have states rights. We have the federal government, which is the supreme government. But states have rights. The Tenth Amendment lays that out for us. All right. But again, states had the ability to make their own laws. All right. And so when the Fifth Amendment says that, you know, you can't deprive any person of certain things, you know, without due process of law, that only applied to the federal government, did not apply to the states. The 14th Amendment made due process uh, and made sure that you can't deprive any person of life, liberty or property without due process of, process of law. It made it applicable to the states. It made the Bill of Rights. It made the first and the second and the third. All of those amendments, it made it applicable to all of the states. All right. So now. We understand that all persons, meaning right after the Civil War, after blacks have been freed, okay, they are now considered persons, no more property, of the United States and subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. They're not subject to the jurisdiction of France or Great Britain or some African country where they may have been stolen from. They are subject to the jurisdiction of the United States and are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Okay, we understand that now. We also now understand that the 14th Amendment made the other amendments applicable to the states. All right. So now the state of Louisiana cannot deprive any person, any person. Remember, now they're persons, life, liberty or property without due process of law. Now, let's go to the last part of Section one of the 14th Amendment, because this is extremely important. OK, because it says this, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of of the laws. What does that mean? I'll tell you in just a second. So listen, I want you to please like, share and subscribe on my YouTube channel and like, comment and follow on your favorite podcast platform. I try to drop episodes as often as I can. You know, I have a really, really busy schedule, you know, but I am committed to my podcast. So please continue to listen. You can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Google Podcasts, CastBox, iHeartRadio and so many more. And again, you can listen to me on my YouTube. YouTube channel as well. You can uh, check me out on my website. It is www.jadenmiller, J-A-Y-D-E-N-M-I-L-L-E-R.com. All right. So now why is that last clause in the 14th Amendment so important? 
Okay. Again, it states, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's really simple. Okay. That means everyone that is a person should be treated equally as it relates to the law. All right. Plain and simple. There is no need for me to explain that. You know what equal means. You know what protection means. You know what the law is. And it simply says, nor deny to any person, any person, black persons, white persons, Asian persons, Latino persons, okay, any person. That also means any person within its jurisdiction. That means if you are a citizen, okay, of Italy, when you come to the United States, you are in the United States jurisdiction. So you have equal protection of the law. All right. You do. Also, if you visit a specific state, it says that no state shall deprive any person. It doesn't say citizens of the United States. It says any person. Okay, life, liberty or property without due process of law. So if you come here, okay, okay, from Brazil, then you have due process of law. If you come here from Great Britain, you cannot be denied equal protection of the law. You cannot. All right. Okay. So now that we've established that, why is the 14th Amendment so important when we talk about Plessy versus uh, Ferguson? Well, it's important because the Supreme Court decided to violate that in which Congress put into place. All right. So let's talk about it. Plessy versus Ferguson challenged Louisiana Separate Car Act of 19, I'm sorry, of 1890. All right. So Louisiana came up with this act. And I'll have to go back and give you a little background on why Louisiana came up with this act. But it required railway companies in the state to provide equal but separate accommodations for the white and colored races. All right. So in 1891, a group of New Orleans residents known as, as the Comité de Citoyens. OK. Uh, and in, in English, it means the, the Committee of Citizens. And they approached a mixed race man named Homer Plessy and asked him to help them get the law repealed. Plessy was a 30 year old shoemaker who identified himself as seven eighths white and one eighth black. If you looked at him, you could not tell that he was black. And of course, back in those days, all right, if you had one drop of black blood, okay, you were considered to be black, okay? You could look whiter than a whitest white man, okay? But if your background, your relatives or someone in your background was black, you were considered black. All right. So Mr. Plessy devoted much of his time to public service and had previously joined a group dedicated to reforming public education in New Orleans. He was in a unique position to challenge the statute since many people assumed he was white. But by law, as I just stated, he was black enough to violate the separate car act. All right. Well, remember now we have a. So uh, we have a amendment to the Constitution in 1868 that says that, you know, no state shall deprive anyone of the equal protection of the laws. All right. Well, then if that's the case, how is Louisiana coming up with the separate car act of 1890? Well, we need to go back in time a little bit. All right. So. There is this little thing, as I mentioned earlier, called Reconstruction. After the Civil War, efforts began in southern states and nationwide to pass laws that were that would protect the rights of African-American. This was known as Reconstruction, as I just mentioned. It was a turbulent time where four million people who were previously enslaved were suddenly integrating into American society. Confederate states were reluctantly coming back into the fold, and it seemed as if the United States were going to be united once again. 
After the Reconstruction Act was passed in 1867, African Americans were elected to government positions, including to the United States Congress. The 14th Amendment followed, which broadened the Constitution's definition of citizenship and granted equal protection of the laws to former slaves. All right. In 1870, Congress approved the 15th Amendment, which states that a person's right to vote cannot be denied based on race. All right. Now, remember, when we're talking about persons, when we're talking about the 15th Amendment, we're talking about men because women didn't get the right to vote until 1920. Okay. All right. So we're talking about men here. All right. You had some states even pass laws banning racial discrimination on public transport and other public facilities. However, a deal made behind closed doors in Congress in 1877 brought an end to those efforts. Let's talk about those for a minute. All right. Because this is so important as to why Louisiana was able to come up with this act in the first place. All right. The Compromise of 1877 is what helped undo this whole thing when it comes to Reconstruction and integrating these former slaves or black people into American society. The 1876 presidential election hinged on disputed vote counts in three states, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. They also happened to be the only three states that still had Reconstruction era Republicans controlling the government. At the beginning of 1877, a bar Bipartisan commission in Congress debated whether to proclaim Rutherford B. Hayes, who was a Republican, the winner of the election. Allies of Hayes met with a few moderate Southern Democrats in secret to negotiate an informal agreement known as the Compromise of 1877. The Southern Democrats agreed to let Hayes be president as long as Republicans withdrew federal troops from the South. That's it. In order for Rutherford B. Hayes, so it was more important for Rutherford B. Hayes to become president, okay, than to uphold the laws that you had established after you had went to war to free people. Hmm. So the removing of federal troops from the South, all right, effectively brought an end to the Reconstruction era. So now states once again began passing laws that disfavored African-Americans and other people of color, including segregation. All right, here we go. The Compromise of 1877. So now as we move back or move ahead in, uh, in time uh, into 1890, now we have states such as Louisiana that are now coming up with these new laws, these separate but equal laws. All right. Hmm. This committee that Mr. Plessy uh, was involved with believed that choosing him, by choosing him, they could argue the consistent application of the law was impossible as it did not define what white and colored actually meant. OK, so on June 7th, 1892, Plessy purchased a first class train ticket on the East Louisiana Railway and sat in the separate car reserved for white passengers. He informed the conductor that he was seven eighths white, according to the committee's plan. When he was asked to move, he refused. All right. So Mr. Plessy was arrested and convicted by a New Orleans court of violating Louisiana's separate car act with the help of the committee, he filed a civil rights complaint against the presiding judge, John H. Ferguson. All right. That's why it's Plessy versus Ferguson, arguing that the law was unconstitutional, unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. All right. So now we have a little bit of the background. Let me give you a little bit more. So. Now, Louisiana comes up with this separate car act of 1890. All right. So this is for trains. Now, 
I want you all to really think about this because you are on Think About It with Jaden Miller. Well, now that means that this act states that the train companies, the railway companies have to now create separate cars. This now puts a financial burden on the East Louisiana Railway and other railway companies. All right. So they are opposed to the Louisiana Separate Car Act. Now, they don't come out publicly and say that, okay, because they are companies they want to operate. And of course, the leaders of these companies have relationships with government officials, with politicians. And so they can't state, okay, publicly that we are opposed to this. But behind the scenes and privately, they are because Guess what? There's this little thing called economics that sometimes trumps human rights. OK, so the railway companies are thinking, well, hell. All right. Now we've got to spend more money to have separate cars. We've got we've got to equip them the same. You know, that's taking away from our profits. All right. So they are against this whole separate car act thing privately. All right. Not publicly, privately. All right. So now this committee in filing this complaint against the judge, John Ferguson, says that, well, the law, this separate car act violates the 14th Amendment's equal protection clause. Well, again, what does the 14th equal protection clause say? It says, again, we have to go back to that second sentence in the 14th Amendment. No state. That means Louisiana. That means Mississippi. That means Alabama. That means Florida. That means Texas. That means none of them shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge, that means lessen, uh, uh, change, modify the privileges or immunities of citizens. Black people are now citizens of the United States. It goes on to say that nor shall any state deprive any person. Remember, black people are now persons of life, liberty or property without due process of law. And then the part that Plessy argues, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. So now we're supposed to be equal. All right. So how are we now equal when you set up a separate car act that determines that black or colored citizens have to sit in one and whites get to sit in another? All right. That's not equal protection. All right. That's called separation. All right. So now that's his thing. So he appeals this to the decision from New, the New, New Orleans court to the Louisiana Supreme Court, which upholds uh, Mr. Ferguson's decision. All right. And so then it is now uh, sent to the United States Supreme Court. All right. Plessy, in his complaint, argues that Louisiana is violating the 13th Amendment and that it is violating the 14th Amendment. He states that it's violating the 13th Amendment because the 13th Amendment has abolished slavery. OK, and his argument is that while as a partial black man, he doesn't have the freedoms, OK, of a white person. All right. He still he feels as though this violates the 13th Amendment. That was sort of a weaker argument. But his most strong argument comes in the fact that he believes that this act violates the 14th Amendment. So the Supreme Court's majority opinion OK, held that even though the Constitution's 14th Amendment established absolute equality under the law, it did not guarantee social equality. Given this, the Supreme Court reasoned that because the accommodations provided for both groups of passengers were equal, it didn't matter that they were separate. Listen to these words here 
from the majority. The object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based on color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. I mean, what a load of crap that is. All right. They say that uh, the majority held that laws that kept different racial populations apart did not violate the 14th Amendment as long as there were equivalent facilities and services available. This separate but equal doctrine was the basis for decades of segregation laws and remained the law of the land for the first half of the 20th century. Hmm. In answer to Plessy's argument that separate rail cars were cars were a thinly veiled way of lab- labeling African Americans as inferior, the majority in the Supreme Court had this to say. If this be so, it is not by reason of anything found in the act, but solely because the colored race chooses to put that construction on it. Wow. In 2022, as I look back on these idiots from 1896, all I can say is, wow. Essentially, the majority held that if anyone had a problem with the law, it was due to their own hangups, not a constitutional issue. Not a constitutional issue. So now, due to this ridiculous argument from the majority, all right, this now set back race relations and it set back the United States as a whole for almost 60 years. And I'm just talking about between 1896 and when another Supreme Court with a better mindset than that one overturned this uh, ridiculous uh, uh, decision. All right. But and I'll talk about why this set us back in a moment. But um, there was one dissent from the United States Supreme Court, and that was from a justice named John Marshall Harlan. He was the only dissenting opinion in the case. All right. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about John Marshall Harlan. All right. Uh, John Marshall Harlan uh, was or came from a political family. All right. He served on the United States Supreme Court for 30 years. All right. Um, he was born in Kentucky and owned slaves. All right. Um, He underwent a series of political and philosophical changes during his uh, or before he actually became a member of the Supreme Court. But when he was still a part of Whig Party, uh, Whig Party politics. So back, you know, earlier on in this country, there was the Whig Party. There was the Republican Party. There was the Democratic Party. The Whig Party, of course, disintegrated. Okay, so now we have this two party system that all of us know about Um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party for the most part. Um, But John Marshall Harlan denounced President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. He did not free his own slaves and they were only freed because of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. That forced his hand. He continued to defend slavery by strongly opposing the 14th and 15th Amendments. OK, uh, but in about 1871, he had this reversal in his beliefs and began to support Reconstruction Amendments. All right. Um, and thus he became a proponent of civil rights for African Americans. All right. I mean, this was a phenomenal transformation. All right. For him. But he looked at this whole case, Plessy versus Ferguson, and it was a seven to one decision. And again, he was the lone dissenter. All right. Um, These are some of the words that he said. 
in his dissent, he held that our Constitution is colorblind. This, this is John Marshall Harlan in 1896, saying this in 1896, that our Constitution is colorblind. He goes on to say that in this country, there is no superior dominant ruling class of citizens and that it is wrong to allow the states to regulate the enjoyment of citizens' civil rights solely on the base, basis of race. So now what John Marshall Harlan is saying in a sentence is that, first of all, when this Constitution was developed, it had says nothing about race. All right. At least not explicitly. All right. Um, it also says nothing about gender. OK, but we know that implicitly it meant that men, specifically white men, were superior and even white women, their wives and daughters, you know, were inferior to them. But he's basically saying that our Constitution is colorblind and he goes on to invoke again implicitly what Thomas Jefferson said at the founding of this country when they decided to break away from the tyrannical rule of King George III in Great Britain that it is wrong to allow the states to regulate the enjoyment. What did Thomas Jefferson say? Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right. So he's saying that it's wrong to allow the states to regulate the enjoyment of citizens' civil rights solely on the basis of race. John Marshall Harlan, Justice John Marshall Harlan, predicted that decision, that this decision would plant the seeds of race hate into state law. He said this in 1896. Was he right? Was he right? Yes, he was right. I answered the question for you before I said, think about it. But was he right? Well, we'll talk about whether he was right or not in just a moment. So listen, um, I really try to um, come up with episodes as often as I can. Sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes I just don't know what to talk about. OK, sometimes I want to make sure that it's something that um, you all will like and, you know, maybe comment on or, you know, maybe it's something that you can learn from. So um, I will I will continue to develop them uh, as best I can. And I want just to make sure that they are relevant to your lives. So uh, I want you to please like, share and subscribe on my YouTube channel and like, comment on your f uh, favorite podcast podcast platform. You can follow me on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, CastBox, iHeartRadio, and so many more. So continue to listen, continue to like, continue to follow, and please continue to comment. All right. So getting back to this thing. All right. Why did this decision set us back? Why did it set us back uh, almost 60 years? Well, um, it set us back because what happened? What happened after this decision? So you had those southern states now. Now the removal there there's the removal of federal troops. OK, so now the laws, uh, the will of the United States government is not now being implemented in the states. All right. Simply because Rutherford B. Hayes wanted to be president. OK, um, they're not being implemented. So uh, the states that have now banned racial discrimination in the South, they are now starting to reverse those things because now the federal government, they feel, has moved their troops out. So that gives them back those, quote unquote, states rights. This decision really, really uh, allowed the states to now move back into the era of slavery. Uh, but when I mean slavery, not chattel slavery. OK, so they were able to now implement these laws and say, oh, well, this is not uh, unequal violating the 14th Amendment. This is equal. But the 14th Amendment says nothing about social status. It doesn't say anything about social mores. All right. Hey, separate but equal. 
All right. So now states that got rid of, you know, the fact that, you know, blacks and whites couldn't get married now have put these back on the books again. OK, they have now forbidden free education and integrated education. All right. These things are now taken away. And so now these southern states have become more powerful in the desire to keep the races separate. Which now brings about these new white citizens councils, all right, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and these other terrorist groups, all right, because what the majority in the Supreme Court says is that, well, we can't legislate people's hearts, okay? And if, you know, black people or white people, if white people want to separate they, themselves from black people, the federal government can't do anything about that, you know, even though you just said that there's equal protection under the law and that black people are citizens and that black people are now persons, okay? And so the Supreme Court, in effect, just wiped aside what Congress, the law of the land that Congress put into effect and thus allowed the southern states to become radical in their decisions to keep black people down. And this separate but equal language, okay, set us back so many years. Why? Well, so now black people are now limited in when, where they can live. See, remember, it's separate but equal. But who determines what's equal? Okay, we know what separate is, but who determines what is what's equal? And when you don't have the weight of the federal government now watching the states, you allow individuals, these races, these separatists to do now what they want to because they have the power of the government. They have the power of the law behind them. So now they can establish there are going to be separate movie theaters. All right. See, they left out the equal part. So now they're going to be separate schools. OK, so now what that means is the white kids get to go to these really nice schools, at least nice for the times back in the, the late 1800s and up until about the midpoint of the ninth of the 1900s. All right. So they left out equal and just said there's going to be separate. OK, so now there are separate water fountains The white people get the nicer water fountain and the black people get the rundown, dirty water fountain. Hmm? Separate toilets. OK, white people use one toilet. Black people use the other toilet that's never cleaned. All right. You want to go to the movies? OK, well, it's going to be hard to have separate movie theaters. So what we'll do is the whites get to sit in the prime seats in the be- at the bottom of the movie theater and the blacks get to sit up you know, stairs in the balcony where they can hardly see or hear. Huh? Okay. So the black kids go to the schools that have no books or books that were old 30 years ago. All right. So now they're not getting the proper education, but it's separate, but equal according to the Southern states. All right. Now also that means that when it comes to separate, but equal, How does that go in terms of criminal law? So now what we have is we have white racists that are emboldened, okay, to now rape black women, assault black men, hang black men, assault black children, okay? Remember, they're separate but equal. So now the courts, okay, that are lined with these judges and attorneys that are also racist, okay, implement this separate but equal. So now blacks can't sit on the jury when there's a black defendant. Okay. Only whites wiping out this whole concept, the jury of your peers. How is it a jury of your peers when you've got 12 races sitting on your jury trying to determine whether your life is going to remain or not or whether or not it's going to be limited? You're going to be sent to prison. Your property is going to be taken away. All right. So that's the damage that the United States Supreme Court under Plessy versus Ferguson caused. It set us back. Remember, it says, hmm, and people say this every single day, the Pledge of Allegiance. That's why people stop saying it, okay? Because they don't believe in it. Hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States 
States of America, the United States of America, United being the key word, and to the republic for which it stands, a republic. What is a republic? A republic is one in which there's fair laws, where people are treated equally, okay, where there's due process, and to the republic for which it stands. Hmm. One nation under God, indivisible, meaning not divided, with liberty and justice for who? For who? If you're back in uh, 1896, for who? Who is liberty and justice for? Think about it with J.D. Miller. Miller, who is it for? Hmm? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Hmm. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did you know that this was written in 1892? The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892, just before this whole Plessy versus Ferguson decision. All right. <laughs> in its original form, it read, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And then in 1923, the words, the flag of the United States of America were added. Okay. And then it was, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But in 1954, in response to the communist threat of the times, President Eisenhower encouraged Congress to add the words under God, creating the 31 word pledge we say today. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Where were these Supreme Court justices, okay, uh, when the Pledge of Allegiance was established, okay? Because I'm sure they had to read the words. And now, you know, even still, in, even in its original form from 1892, it still says, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the Repub republic for which it stands. There's still the words one nation. There's still the word indivisible. And then it also says with liberty and justice for all. However, those Supreme Court justices refuse to believe that liberty and justice, indivisible and one nation means togetherness. They means, oh, well, socially it means separate but equal, separate but equal. But that's not what it says here. It says we're one nation. How can we be separate but equal if we're one nation? Think about it with Jaden Miller. Think about that for a minute. So the significance of the Plessy versus Ferguson case is that for almost 60 years, or at least almost 60 years would pass before the Supreme Court overturn the separate but equal doctrine in the case called Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. It was decided on May 17, 1954. The Supreme Court in Brown decided that segregated schools were inherently unequal and therefore violated the Constitution. Why? Because John Marshall Harlan says that that's ridiculous, that our Constitution is colorblind, that there, in this country there is no superior, dominant, ruling citizens, and that it is wrong to allow the states to regulate the enjoyment, the, uh, the enjoyment 
enjoyment, the education, the pursuit of happiness of citizens, civil rights solely on the basis of race. Why did it take 16 years, almost 60 years for people to realize this? It is one of the few cases where the Supreme Court explicitly overrules its own precedent because they were idiots back in 1896, with the exception of John Marshall Harlan. And even then, the court did not deem all segregation of public facilities unconstitutional. In the intervening years between the decision in Plessy versus Ferguson and that of Brown versus the Board of Education, state and local governments implemented racial segregation laws in communities, not just in the South, but all across the country. There were laws against or or put into uh, uh, housing laws that kept African-Americans and Mexicans and Asians and whomever that did not look white from moving into certain communities. See, it's not just the South. Okay, there were areas in the North and in the West as well that came up with these laws that segregated people. And so the impact of Plessy versus Ferguson is that even though those laws no longer exist, their impact remains today. That's because we have people today that are in Congress or walking around amongst us that really wish people south of the Arizona border, people that come Uh, at least through their descendants from the continent of Africa and maybe from some parts of Asia as well, that they are deemed less than those people who came here from Europe and stole this land from the American Indians, another group who has been racially uh, targeted and messed over in the history of this country as well, because those people are still walking amongst us today. That's why the impact still remains. And these people, because they don't have the the political power now, okay, they still have the private power, okay, to talk amongst themselves in their living rooms and in their churches, okay, about how they wish the days of their grandparents were back. Hmm. I think one thing that can be taken away from this is that even though Plessy versus Ferguson is no longer good law, and there are plenty of arguments to make that it never was, the case is a good reminder that the American legal system is capable of change. All right. It is capable of change. But who does the changing? See, the American legal system doesn't change on its own. See, the Supreme Court didn't decide upon itself. Oh, we're going to look at separate but equal and change it. Okay, no, that's because there were people, the people that came forward and said it's time that this is changed. It's not the American legal system. Yeah, the American legal system changes because the will of the people step forward. Okay. see, there needed to be a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because, see, there was a 14th Amendment that said we should be what? Treated equally. There should be equal protection under the law, but we weren't being treated equally under the law. And so you needed a Dr. King. You needed an NAACP. All right. Because the American government was not doing what it was set up to do. How do you break away from one nation and then implement racial hatred and racial segregation and slavery in one that you just set up. How do you deny people freedoms? And when I say freedoms, I'm not just talking about chattel, okay? Meaning holding people in bondage. I'm talking about treating people. Chinese people and Japanese people were treated horribly in this country. Uh, Latin Americans were treated horribly in this country. Black people were treated horribly in this country. And my gosh, the American Indians were really treated horribly and still are to this very day. And so that's the impact that Plessy versus Ferguson had. See, people had to fight to get these things. These things that had already been established, at least for one segment of our society. 
All right. So this is Think About It with Jaden Miller. We've been talking about the significance of the Plessy versus Ferguson United States Supreme Court decision. All right. I hope that this helps you in some way to understand not only the case, but the compromise of 1877, the fact that uh, the 14th Amendment made the other amendments applicable to the states. That's very important for you to know and understand uh, that there was at least one powerful dissent in this decision, a dissent that stated that our Constitution is colorblind. And then finally, the significance from 1896 taking us into today of Plessy versus Ferguson. All right. Thank you for joining me again. Please like, share and subscribe on my YouTube channel and like, comment and follow on your favorite podcast platform. This is Jaden Miller. Thank you for joining me on Think About It with Jaden Miller. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Think About It with Jaden Miller. Don't forget to like and subscribe to his YouTube channel and like and follow on your favorite podcast platform.